Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar hosted by the Rochester Regional Center for Autism Spectrum Disorders. Today's webinar is called Increasing the Leisure and Recreational Skills of Persons with ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. And today's presenter will be Dr. David McAdam, um, joining us from the Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities, which is the University of Rochester's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Before we get started, I'd like to um, remind everyone that feel free to use your chat box for any questions or comments that you might have throughout the webinar, and we'll take a couple minutes at the end to review those. A little bit about our Rochester Regional Center for Autism Spectrum Disorder. Um, here you'll see a map of our state, and we are actually one of seven regional centers for autism in New York. So we cover 12 counties in central New York, that blue area, and all of these um, regional centers for autism focus on community education and technical assistance um, funded by uh, the New York State Department of Education. So any um, resources that you're, you might be looking for specifically to autism, feel free to check out our website. Um, all of our webinars, our information sheets, and a couple other great resources are located on there. So including today's webinar will be recorded and the slides will be posted on the website too for your reference. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to David McAdam. Um, again, feel free to type any questions, comments you might have, and we'll also send out a evaluation survey following today's uh, webinar. We welcome your feedback um, and any other uh, topics that you'd be interested in, in us presenting in the future. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us and enjoy. So welcome to the, excuse me, welcome to the webinar today. Um, what we're going to do is just talk a little bit about the concept of leisure time, recreational time. We're then gonna talk about some background information. After we talk about the background information, we're gonna talk about what are the various ways in which you can assess, identify, leisure and recreational skills to teach individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And then we're gonna talk, sort of based the, the webinar on the concept that most problems related to participation in leisure and recreational activities is either a problem related to engagement or it's a problem related to having a skill deficit or a combination of those two things. And we're gonna talk about some common interventions you can do to increase the individual's level of active engagement. And then we're gonna talk about um, some examples of systematic instructional teaching methods. So this to sort of that we're all on the same page that we're talking about the same thing. What is leisure? Leisure is defined as the quality of, its, of experience or free time. And free time is the time we spend away from business work, job hunting, domestic chores, and educational activities. And so leisure refers to an individual's free time when the person can do what he or she prefers to do. And today, we're going to use the term leisure and recreational activities interchangeably. The importance of leisure and recreational time is recognized by a variety of organizations and laws. For example, it's recognized by the United Nations and the No Child Left Behind Act, and also the Individual with Disabilities Education Improvement Act of 2004. So what are the benefits of leisure or recreational time or activities? It, they can, leisure time can have a positive impact on our physical health, it can also have a positive impact on our mental health. It can reduce our stress. Um, the next point is a really important one. So one of my areas of interest is challenging or problem behaviors of people with disabilities. 
And one of the fundamental interventions for challenging behaviors is promoting engagement and, and activities, including leisure and recreational activities. So high level of engagement in activities tends to compete or is preventative for the display of challenge and behaviors. Leisure and recreational activities can also promote the development of friendships. They can broaden an individual's interest and also increase their family satisfaction. One of the characteristics of leisure time is that it's age dependent. So young children generally do not have assigned duties or responsibilities, so they tend to have more time to engage in leisure or recreational activities. Um, as children enter school, they have more structure to their schedule and that in typically increases across grades, which results in a reduction of leisure or play time. Adults generally have reduced leisure time also due to work activities. And then typically, uh, the amount of time we have for leisure or recreational activities, um, again, increases as we enter our retirement years. The US government actually publishes data on leisure and recreational activities. Um, this is a result of uh, some data from a federal survey. It shows that younger individuals spend more time uh, engaged in activities related to computers, while older adults uh, spend more time um, engaged in activities such as reading. So it's just a breakdown of categories of activities by age. There's also um, some differences based on gender. So for example, um, federal data indicates that men spend more time watching TV on average than women. Um, in my house, that's referred to as the ESPN effect. Um, it's also important to make a distinction between leisure and non-leisure time. And this distinction can be made by looking at the various environments in which leisure and non-leisure activities take place. So work is um, typically a, is a non-leisure time due to the fact that we have assigned work. School is non, a non-leisure time also due to the fact it involves assigned work. Home is a combination of leisure, so I might spend time at home reading a book, and non-leisure activities. So cooking dinner, doing my laundry would be considered to be non-leisure activities. Another example of a situation that may be a combination of leisure and non-leisure time would be going to the, I might go to my local mall, uh, I might you know, sit at Starbucks, visit with a friend, that would be a leisure activity, but I also might shop for clothes for work. So that would be considered to be a non-leisure activity. Related, <coughs> related to people with disabilities, uh, generally individuals with autism spectrum disorder spend less time participating in organized community-based leisure activities than children with other disabilities or their typically developing peer. So the lack of participation the lack of engagement in leisure activities is oftentimes problematic for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. So 
So we're going to transition in the presentation. So we've talked about necessary background information. So now we're going to talk about how the various ways in which we can assess um, and identify leisure activities that individual may enjoy participating in. The assessment of leisure activities is really divided into a couple categories. There's indirect assessment methods, which consists of surveys and interviews. And there's some direct, there's also direct assessment measures of leisure activities. So we can observe a person in the environment, look at the type of activities they are, they are engaged in, look at their overall level of engagement and leisure activities. So what are the preferences, the rationales, excuse me, for conducting um, assessment of, of an individual's level of, of engagement in leisure or recreational activities? Um, first of all, you can identify a person's preferences and interests across a variety of categories. So this might include physical activities, sensory activities, uh, social activities, or, or leisure activities. You can also identify if the person has any categories of activities that they dislike. So I might not enjoy engaging in sports activities. I might find um, places, settings in which they're particularly loud, aversive, and tend to want to avoid those sorts of places. You can also look at an individual's history of past and present presentation, uh, participation in leisure activities across settings. So is the person more likely to engage in leisure activities at home? Do they have a particular difficult time at school participating in, in, in activities? You can look at a person's current knowledge and skills related to leisure activities. And then you can also look at their current partners and interests of family, family members and friends. And this may be important, particularly important for individuals with um, ASD who have difficulty establishing and maintaining friendships. The, the key in the sort of assessment model we're talking about today, that there's a key question. And the key question really is, is the individual's leisure deficits, difficulties, related to a lack of engagement in functional activities? Is it related to a skill deficit? Or is it related to both a lack of engagement and a skill deficit? So my experience tells me that oftentimes individuals with autism spectrum disorders both have difficulty and need their environments enriched with more activities to do, but they may also have need help and instruction on how to participate in particular activities. So really, I think personally the key question from an assessment of leisure or recreational activities is, is it a lack of engagement issue or is it a skill deficit issue? Or again, it could very well be a combination of both of those things. Mentioned this earlier, but what are our, the assessment tools that are available to us? They really fall into two categories, indirect methods, which would be surveys and interviews, and then direct um, assessment methods, which really consists of direct observation, so behavioral observation, or direct behavioral assessments. We're gonna talk about a, a couple assessments designed to help identify high preference items or activities today. So one of those is, for example, it's called a paired stimulus choice preference assessment.
The first category of assessments is our surveys. And surveys typically look something like this. So it's a list of activities and an individual endorses uh, whether or not a person has done this, in, this activity in the past. Do they currently do it? Do you believe they may have interest in doing it? What are the advantages of surveys? Um, surveys are relatively easy to administer. They're low cost. The person who completes them, the informant, it can be a variety of, of, of people. It could be the individual with a disability, him or herself. It could be a parent. It could be a teacher. Parents and teachers can use um, surveys with not a lot of uh, additional support um, from other professionals. They're time efficient and people generally report that they have faced social, social validity. So most people report that they like um, surveys to identify leisure and recreational activities and that the information they receive is helpful. What are the disadvantages? Um, the disadvantages are that they're based on um, subjective report. So subjective memory, which may or may not be um, accurate. Also, there's, no, there's few, if any, empirical evaluations demonstrating the effectiveness of, of surveys. So they haven't been evaluated um, in database studies that are peer reviewed. So we can't refer to, we, we shouldn't think of surveys as being evidence-based, well-established, uh, having strong psychometric properties. The next category of indirect assessment is interviews. Interviews, again, are an indirect assessment technique. Um, and people who know the individuals can provide uh, useful information about their choices, their behavioral challenges. So if they engage in a particular activity, are they, for example, likely to also engage in stereotypic or repetitive behavior? So is that particular activity in any way problematic? They can be conducted with individuals or groups. So you can do, conduct an interview, for example, with a school individual school educational team. Um, generally, interviews, it's preferable to do them face-to-face. -face. However, they can also be conducted by phone or by email. What are the, some of the, the questions that are typically included in um, interviews? So one question might be, how does a person show or express their interest? What activities does the person enjoy? What types of new activities do you think the person would be interested in? What activities have the person done in the past, but they, didn't enjoy um, participating in them. So who can you interview? You can interview the, the parents of an individual, caregivers, educators, so people such as teachers, speech therapists, occupational therapists, and you can also interview the individual themselves. This might be the most useful thing to do. Um, you know, if they have the level of expressive language to answer the questions. So we have some tips here if you're interested in interviewing an individual with autism spectrum disorder. Um, it's probably preferable that the interview is conducted by someone that the person knows. 
also probably preferable that it's conducted in a familiar environment. It may be useful to include visual supports. So pictures of activities uh, to guide the conversation. And we should attempt to match our questions and the wording of our questions to the individual's receptive language skills. So we're making a transition from indirect assessment methods to direct assessment methods. And the first direct assessment method that's available to us is direct observation. And if, so by direct observation, we're talking about spending time watching or observing the individual at times and in settings in which they're likely to engage or likely have the opportunity or should be engaged in, in leisure or recreational activities. So what are the things that you can look at through direct observation? Um, so the first key things is you can look at the overall level of engagement. So is the individual participating in activities at a reasonable level? So I think the question here is when you, in your mind, when you picture a same age peer, is the individual's level of engagement relatively similar to what you might expect from a same age peer without, a, without autism spectrum disorder. You can also look at uh, the, the overall level of environmental enrichment. So I'm a behavior analyst by training and Todd Risley is a very early behavior analyst and what Todd did in his career was one of the things he really emphasized was the notion of creating enriched environments for people with disabilities. And um, Todd summarized this in a book chapter towards the end of his life, which is referred to as Get a Life. And if we talk to Todd, what, what Todd would really was talking about when he was talking about creating um, a high quality of life for individuals with disabilities was to create an environment that was enriched, that had lots of opportunities to engage in leisure and recreational activities, really all the activities that we all routinely engage in, and that for people with disabilities, we wanted the level, the number of opportunities to match sort of the, the number that we all have in our life. Um, so you can look at how enriched the environment is. So, and where the, in the various places in which the person spends time, is there enough opportunity? Is there the things physically present that may promote engagement? So if you go to a classroom, you know, does it have toys, other activities available, say during break times, that are likely to promote A, engagement, and B, the opportunity to teach leisure or recreational skills. You can also look at the impact of choice on engagement through observation. So we know from published studies that one of the ways that we can promote engagement is by increasing the opportunities that an individual has to express their choices. And we'll look at some examples of that um, shortly. You can also look at choice of leisure companions. Um, does the presence or absence of a particular person make a difference? Uh, 
does the individual only engage in leisure activities with a small number of people or do they engage in activities with everyone who's present in their environments and you can also look at choice of preferred locations so do i prefer indoor activities versus outdoor activities Some other things we can observe for um, is the type of interactions with items or activities. Is the person actively engaged or is the person oftentimes passively engaged? So do they stand back and watch other individuals participate in the game, but they don't participate themselves? We can also look to identify skills that need to be taught through systematic instruction. So the person expresses interest in playing a particular game, but currently they don't appear to have the skills necessary, which suggests that we might wanna task analyze, break down um, the, the particular skills required for the game into component steps and have the person practice each of those steps. You can also, through system direct observation, um, look for um, skill deficits that interfere. And with individuals with autism spectrum disorder, this is likely to be um, things like a high rate of stereotypic or repetitive behavior. So we know that stereotypic engagement and stereotypic or repetitive behavior competes with engagement in functional activities. So if I'm an individual with autism spectrum disorder, it engages in a high rate of stereotypic or repetitive behavior, and our goal is to increase my engagement in leisure or recreational activities, um, I, we may need to, as a team, develop a behavioral intervention plan to address the individual stereotypic repetitive behavior in order to have the opportunity to teach um, leisure or recreational skills. So when should we conduct direct observation? We should conduct them both during structure times, both during the school day, during a play group, and during unstructured time after getting off of work or school or during the weekends. So direct observation can be done very informally. So, you know, you can get a notebook and you can use your smartphone and you can measure the number, the duration in which a person engages in leisure and recreational activities. You can note the, the types of activities, or it can be done much more formally. So this is a study that myself and some of my colleagues published in 1997. And the issue here was adults that lived in group homes who were deinstitutionalized. And what we noted was that during downtimes in their schedule, so this would be, um, would be times after they had came home from work, but before they participated in household activities, they tended to sit around not engaged. And what we did was we measured their initial level of engagement and then what we did was we put that activity schedule in place. It's a little bit complicated, a graph, but I'll, I'll summarize it for you. So by structuring the downtime using activity schedules, which were essentially picture sequences of the leisure activities in which the person should be engaging, 
and providing those activities, those schedules to both the individual and their direct care staff. What we got on average was a much higher level of engagement overall in the group homes um, when the schedule was in place versus when the schedule wasn't in place. Um, and we know that because we measured their, both their level of engagement and challenge in behavior using direct observation. So the point here is direct observation can be conducted using um, in very um, simple ways using a, a paper and pencil and a smart form or with complex behavioral codes. So after you conduct the assessment piece, and so the question becomes, is it an engagement issue for the individual, or is it a skill deficit that requires systematic instruction? So for our purposes, to illustrate possible interventions, um, I've divided divided the, the, the interventions we're talking about into two categories. Those designed to promote active engagement and systematic instructional strategies. So what to do if you conclude, what you might do if you conclude that the individual has a problem related to engagement. So there's a lack of an engaging environment. And part of the, the issue may be, um, we talked earlier about, you know, Todd Risley's emphasis on creating enriched environments. There simply may not be enough things available for the person to do. So how can you identify new things? Well, one, way, one thing you can do is you can conduct a preference assessment. You can allow the individual to sample things and you can look at either what they choose or what they choose to engage in. So there's really two ways you can conduct a, a preference assessment. One is referred to, the first way is a duration-based preference assessment. So you typically identify um, a variety of items or activities, um, eight to 10 or so. You present the items one at a time, and you present each item to the individual, and you ask them to try it for a predetermined period of time. So generally three minutes, five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. Typically we don't do it for longer than 10 minutes because studies have shown that brief sampling periods are predictive of, of longer periods of time. And then you record the duration of engagement. So you record the duration in which the individual engages in each of the activities. Um, the other thing you may want to do is if the individual displays a lot of repetitive or stereotypic behavior, you might also want to record how often they engage in repetitive or stereotypic behavior so that you can identify activities that both they enjoy doing and they're unlikely to promote repetitive or stereotypic behavior. So you're really kind of doing two interventions at once. You're increasing the person's engagement in leisure or recreational activities and simultaneously you're decreasing the likelihood that they may engage in repetitive or stereotypic behavior. So a graph that illustrates uh, a summary of an outcome for uh, a duration-based preference assessment. So this individual um, enjoyed uh, puzzles and keyboards and marbles, and not surprisingly, uh, engaged a little less in, in more, some more domestic-like activities. So what we would do is if we thought, if we were concerned about the individual's level of engagement and lack of an enriching environment, 
we can make these things available to the person throughout their day during periods of time where they tended not to be engaged and where it was appropriate for them to engage in leisure or recreational activities. Um, this is from a study published in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis by April Warsdale. Um, it's vocational-like task, but it's a nice, if you're interested, um, it's a nice reference to an article that describes the duration-based preference assessment. And what April does a nice job of showing is the point I discussed earlier, is that shorter sampling periods of time um, seem to work a, approximately as well as longer periods of time. So the point, the, the point here is if you choose to have an individual sample items um, and measuring how the duration in which they're engaged, um, you can select a relatively brief period of time. And so the assessment is relatively um, time effective. My personal preference for identifying um, items or activities is doing something called a paired stimulus choice preference assessment. So another assessment method. Again, identify eight to 10 items. You pair every item with every other item. And then the individual is provided with the opportunity to choose between the, the two paired items and you provide them the opportunity to engage in the item that they select. So every item is paired with every other item. Again, this is an example of the results you might receive. So this individual um, enjoyed the squeeze ball more than they did the books. Uh, again, things that are identified as high preference, if the issue is a lack of an enriched environment, you can use those items uh, and make them available to enrich the person's day, thus promoting their engagement in leisure or recreational activities. If you believe you have a engagement issue, another thing you can do is you can evaluate whether or not choice makes a difference. So we know that from a number of published studies that for some individuals with disabilities, the opportunity to make choices, to express choices, results in a much higher level of engagement in functional activities. Um, what's the advantage of this assessment? It's an easy assessment for parent, folks like parents and teachers to conduct. So you don't necessarily need you know, consultation from someone um, outside of your program. And we know that for some individuals, the opportunity to express choices can make a significant uh, difference. Further, we know that the opportunity to make choices may reduce some individuals' escape maintained behaviors and it also may reduce some individuals' uh, sensory maintain <coughs> challenging behaviors. So in 1994, uh, Glenn Dunlap in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis provided a nice example of the relationship between task engagement and the opportunities to make choices. So you look at this graph, the top panel, what it shows is when the individual was provided the opportunity to make choices, um, there was a higher level and a more consistent level of engagement than when somebody else made the choices for them. If you look at the bottom panel, um, what it also, what it illustrates is that there's a lower rate overall of challenge in behavior during the choice condition than the no choice condition, indicating that for some individuals, the opportunity to express choices 
also serves as a potentially important component of a behavioral intervention plan to reduce challenge in behavior. This slide is just some clinical data I collected. And really the point here is that, you know, sometimes we, we, if you're like me, you pick up a research study, you read it, you wonder, you know, does it really work in real life? Is it practical? Can I actually do it? Well, this is a choice, no choice assessment. You know, it's not as sophisticated as the one published by Glenn Dunlap. So there's no, um, replication of the, the choice condition or the no choice condition. There is an experimental design. However, when you look at the data, um, the data I collected for this individual indicated that choice did make a difference in terms of their level of engagement. And this whole assessment probably took me about three hours to conduct, indicating that you know the information that Glenn Dunlap published resulted in an assessment that's practical, can be used to increase an individual's engagement in functional activities. In this category type of intervention, if you conclude that what you have is an engagement issue, is you can restructure, restructure the environment. And a couple examples of this. So this is a study conducted by Alan Harchek in community-based group homes for people with developmental disabilities. And what he looked at was what happens when someone comes in on a regular schedule provides feedback on, to staff on the level of engagement of the adults with developmental disabilities, and really provides supports uh, in terms of what the staff should do to promote engagement. And when this ongoing consultation and support was in place, what you see is an increase in the overall engagement of the individuals that lived in the group home indicating that their quality of life also improved. And then when the consultation went away, was taken away, what you see is the level of engagement returns approximately to the baseline level, which really tells us that, you know, highly structured environments with consistent in which people where the people who work in those settings receive consistent feedback um, results in higher levels of engagement for individuals with disabilities. I mentioned Todd Risley um, earlier on, sort of one of my uh, personal behavioral heroes in behavior analysis. And this is old study, but it also illustrates how you can structure an environment. So, what Todd did in a series of studies was showing that for a whole variety of different groups of people, so for typically developing children in preschool settings, for adults with people with disabilities um, in group homes, and for elderly folks in care facilities, if the, the intervention is called um, having a active sort of staff assignment program manager. And what they do is they assign, what Todd did, did in this series of studies was assign particular roles to staff. So one staff was assigned the role of enriching the environment, make sure that things are available. Another staff was assigned the role of going around, making sure that people were prompted to engage in activities, that the environment um, was properly structured, and what they, the outcome across this series of studies is that by us in staff particular roles, by enriching the environment, 
what you get is a substantial increase in the level of active engagement. Again, <clears throat> a lot of this work was done during downtimes, during what would be appropriate times to engage in leisure or recreational activities. The, so making a transition, so we've talked about if you identify lack of engagement, lack of uh, having a rich environment as the issue, now uh, we're gonna talk about what you can do if you identify a need for systematic instruction. Again, you know, probably the reality is for most people, you're gonna wanna do a combination of these two things. Make sure that you have enriched environment, make sure you've identified high preference items or activities, and also provided systematic instruction. So one of my Personally, one of my favorite interventions for promoting um, engagement, well, promoting engagement in leisure activities is the use of activity schedule. So this study provides a nice example of that, a nice example using sort of current technology, uh, iPod. The participants are four uh, boys with autism spec ASD, eight to 12 years of age. And they were all enrolled in an applied behavior analytic public education program. So <clears throat> the program was using um, a behavioral based discrete trial curriculum, highly structured environment um, that emphasized skills such as you know teaching imitation, respect receptive expressive language skills those sorts of things and additionally all the participants had experience using um, ipod touch at school so they were familiar um, with the technology and what they did was they put developed activity schedules for the ipod which is illustrated in in this picture from the article and uh, this is the complicated graph that um, shows the so shows the outcome. So the intervention was essentially practicing using and practicing following the schedule on the iPad Touch. A adult systematically prompted you if you had difficulty, so they systematically helped you, and then across time, the, the amount of assistance was faded. So this is a, the graph's a multiple baseline uh, across individuals, and it looks a little bit complicated, but let me sort of um, summarize it for you. So if you look at the, the phase, the baseline phase, none of the individuals have the skills to use a activity schedule on iPod to engage in recreational activities. What you don't see on the graph is there's a period of time of very systematic instruction. So adults helping you practice, they're correcting any errors you make, they're having you practice again. After you reach a criteria, and you've demonstrated that you can use the iPod, the schedule on your iPod. And then what the, what the researchers did was they evaluated the student's use of the iPod um, under the same conditions as, as the baseline, so with no assistance from anyone. And what you see is that each of the participants could independently use their iPod 
to engage in recreational leisure activities. The author then asked the, also asked the question, what about if we changed the activities on the iPod? So we made them novel activities that the person wasn't familiar with. They weren't part of the teaching. They, what they attained, what they saw was a, the person could do the activities at a higher level than in the baseline condition, but not quite as high as when the, they were activities that they had been previously taught. So systematic schedules are an instruction related to how to follow a schedule is a really nice way to promote uh, participation in leisure or recreational activities. Another systematic instructional approach that's been used is really a task analysis model. And um, a 1986 study by Tony Kuvo um, is one of my favorites that illustrates this model. So what is a task analysis? So this is a task analysis <coughs> for playing connect floor four. So a task analysis is simply breaking a skill down to each of its component steps. And in this case, the skill that was being taught was macrame, which is, if I have it right, um, is a form of weaving using cords and knots. It was at one point in time uh, extremely popular. Uh, my understanding is it's sort of coming back in popularity. More people have been doing it recently type of things, you make a variety of things. So you can make um, plant holders, keychains, curtains, vest. Oftentimes, um, beads are also incorporated. The participants were five individuals with mild disabilities. And what they do in this study is they take they take a macrame book of, of instructions to build various things and they look at the various types of knots that are required to follow um, to construct a particular item. And then what they do is they teach each of those particular knot types, which is illustrated here. So the knot itself, the steps for making it is broken down in steps. Uh, someone prompts you through it, you make a mistake, they correct the mistake, they model for you how to make the structure. What they found was they could successfully teach the individuals how to make the various knots. Then what they do is they at the end the individuals could make a plant hanger, a key ring, and a towel ring. Um, and they weren't taught how to make each of those as part of the teaching, but they were taught how to make each of the required types of knots. So the point here is that a task analysis model, breaking a, a skill down into its substeps, is oftentimes a very useful way to teach a, a leisure or recreational skill that a person doesn't have in their repertoire. Another one final example of the use of systematic teaching is a study by Rogers. So the skill um, targeted here is fundamental swimming skills. 
The intervention used is referred to as a constant time delay procedure. Um, so you start off by immediately prompting the person on how to display the this component skill related to swimming. So the skills that they focused on were a flutter kick, an arm stroke, and a head turn. Uh, so you start off by immediately prompting the person. And then what you do is you wait uh, initially a brief period of time to see if the person initiate the skill unprompted. If they don't initiate it, you then prompt them and you gradually fade out your prompts over time. That's referred to as a constant time delay procedure. And what this, again, it's sort of a bit of a complicated graph, but what it shows is that systematic modeling and fading of prompts results in the acquisition of these basic swim school skills, which you know, is, a, is a leisure or recreational activity that the individuals previously could not engage in. And I just want to thank everyone for um, participating in the webinar today. And I think we have opportunity for you to ask any questions you might have. Folks, feel free to enter any questions or comments in your chat box. And we'll go through them. Great, we had a question um, regarding the slides after today's webinar, yes. Um, and we were actually able to record it as well. So what I'll do is send everybody a link to the recording and the slides um, following today's webinar so you have these to reference. Thank you. Great, we also got a question um, regarding uh, perhaps a certificate of attendance for attending today's webinar, and absolutely, we can provide that to you. Um, many times our attendees apply for CEUs following our webinars as well, so um, if you are interested in getting a certificate of attendance to prove that you attended today's webinar, um, feel free to reach out to us. So David's email is on the slide here, um, and you can also reach us um, the, at the Regional Center team at RRC, ASD at urmc.rochester.edu. Let me see, it should be on the next slide here too. Perfect, I did just advance the slide too um, with our website. So that's where you can access all of our archived webinars as well. Um, and our next webinar is actually coming up in just um, two short weeks on January 16th um, regarding visuals to increase tolerance for waiting in children with autism. Um, so I encourage everybody to check that out as well. You can register right online like you did for this one. Thank you. We have some great questions coming through. We'll repeat them back. So there's a question about additional resources. What I can do is I will make a list of suggested resources and references and I'll make them I'll give them a Valerie and they can be placed on the the, the regional centers webpage yeah absolutely great thank you so much for the feedback and the comments coming through too we appreciate it So the question that just came through is, am I familiar with the leisure diagnostic battery? And do I find it helpful? Um, I am not familiar with it. It's not a, a tool that I've used. Um, I will try to take a look at it though.
Great. We'll give folks another couple minutes um, in case you have any more questions or comments. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, if you do have any questions or comments moving forward, too, please feel free to contact us, um, and David and I will make sure that we get you, whether they're resources or some answers, um, and we'd like to take the time to say thank you for joining us. Um, we hope you found this topic informative, and uh, please take the time to give us some feedback. Um, we want to make sure that these webinars and any information that we're disseminating to the community is useful, um, and is what people are looking for and what they benefit from. So we appreciate you calling in today. Great. Well, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much.